Hello class, welcome back to uh, part two of our discussion of chapter one and income taxes. So, uh, like anyone, the government and the IRS representing the government uh, doesn't want to wait uh, until it's clear until the end of the year to get their uh, tax receipts from you. And so there are various ways in which individuals must pay or do pay their taxes as they go along. The, the, by far the most common one is that your employer withholds uh, your taxes from your check. So right at, before you even get the money, they take some of it out of your check and then remit it to the IRS or to the government. This is all reported on your W-2, how much it was deducted. Uh, this can be more than uh, you actually can be given back some of it in, in the form of an earned income credit. We'll talk about that later. So uh, you actually can, can get more money. It's not always just withholding. Uh, but uh, this happens a little bit at each time, every two weeks or every month when you get paid. So at the end of the year, you're going to compare what you paid in over the course of the year on your W-2 with what you actually owed on your 1040. So if you, uh, your tax liability, how much you owe is greater than what you paid in, you'll, you'll have to pay with the return. Uh, when you file that, you'll have to pay the remainder. If you uh, put in more than your tax liability, then you receive, could receive a refund. Uh, of course, that's what everybody talks about in April or what, in the first of the year when they file, is getting a tax refund. This is just simply people having paid more than they owed and they're getting uh, that amount uh, back. So they were what we refer to as overwithheld uh, on their, in their, from their checks based on the calculation. So some way or another, uh, the calculation was incorrect uh, and that's why they're getting money back. We are never gonna get probably exact, but we ought to be able to get close to what we owe and have that amount withheld if we do it correctly. So these are some slides and some information uh, in the appendix to your chapter one about finding tax authority. So I think this is important. There's no way that anyone can remember all of the tax laws. So you need to be able to look it up and not only look it up and find the answer, but also that communicate that answer to your client or to your to the IRS if you are uh, working with them. So uh, to understand that there are three types of primary tax authority, statutory, administrative, and judicial. Statutory uh, is the Congress. And you might include the U.S. Constitution, the 16th Amendment we referred to earlier. Uh, Every time Congress passes a law, it updates the Internal Revenue Code. So that is actually the, 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 the law. Uh, and then during the process of passing laws, we have, it goes to committees. If you'll remember from your social uh, studies class, how we pass laws in the United States. Uh, and if it has to do with taxes, it is either the Senate's Finance Committee or the House Ways and Means Committee. Those committees have lots of hearings and talk a lot about the laws, and so we can get some idea of what they mean when they were not clear in the law from that process. Uh, obviously, that takes some uh, interpretation as well. So that's the first, you might say, the best tax authority is what was passed actually by Congress. Hard to argue with that as long as it is clear. Then, of course, uh, the, we have uh, the administrative 
or executive branch of the government. Uh, this is the IRS and the Treasury Department. Treasury Department, is, IRS is part of the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department does other things, but uh, this is where uh, we interpret that law that was written by Congress. Sometimes Congress actually says this is what we want you to do. We want you to, to write regulations. We're not going to do all the detail, so we're going to leave it up to the IRS to come up with the detail. Other times, um, they are just vague and, and, and they're not so clearly directive in their, in their uh, prescription. So different ways, treasury regulations, different types of regulations, temporary regulations and legislative regulations. There's revenue rulings uh, that have to do with lots of people Lots of, when the question keeps coming up to the IRS, they may issue a ruling which basically says this is how we think this should be done. In all of these cases, revenue procedures, private letter rulings, IRS notices. Now, those last two private letter rulings and IRS notices do not apply to a people other than those who were, they were sent to. Uh, while they may give I, some idea of what the IRS is thinking, they are not what we call, uh, they do not have the rule of law, they are not original, uh, or can't be used as precedent for other decisions. Now, when I see these administrative sources and I refer to a treasury regulation, that is an original source. Revenue ruling is an original source. Then there will be people that come along and write about that and try to explain it. Those are secondary sources. While they can be valuable, secondary sources are not um, the actual uh, rules that you can use. So for instance, if you get in a dispute with the IRS over a uh, certain item, you may use primary sources, treasury regulations, revenue rulings, pro revenue procedures, the Internal Revenue Code to make your case. You cannot use and will not be allowed and they will not accept secondary sources, things that somebody else said, like your textbook, despite it's uh, you know, well-written perhaps, uh, but it is not an original source. Even the IRS publications are not original sources. Uh, they explain treasury regulations, revenue rulings, they may even quote from them. When they are quoting revenue rulings or procedures, then that is an original source, but they themselves are not original sources. Then the last one, when we can't agree, when we fight with the IRS and it can't come to a conclusion, we go to court and then we can find, we have the judges uh, who make determinations. These are uh, three different courts that decide these. Most situations end up in tax court. These are special judges with uh, tax training. That's the only kind of cases they deal with. And so most of the time, you're best off in tax court if you're going to be arguing about a particular uh, complicated tax issue. However, you can go to district court and the Court of Federal Claims. The other nice thing about the tax court is you can appeal to the tax court without paying the tax. You cannot, to these other two courts, you must pay it and then sue for a refund in those courts. So. By far and away, the most, most of the cases get decided in a tax court. And you think, it sounds like it's one place. Tax court has, has locations all across the country. It is a whole series of tax judges um, that have different locations around the country. It's not, you don't have to go one place particular to, to file in a tax court. If you don't like your de the decision, you can appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, you can ask to appeal to the Supreme Court. However, the Supreme Court is the only court that gets to choose. 
uh, they choose who, what appeals they actually going to listen to. Uh, they do not take very many tax cases, uh, perhaps one or two per year of all of the disputes at most. Uh, you, the U.S. Ap appeals courts have to take your if you uh, if you appeal. Uh, at this point, it, you are going to have to have an attorney in these situations to represent you uh, and because things have gotten uh, very complicated in terms of how you present evidence you can't just go in there and make your case. There is a small court, small claims area of tax court where you can kind of go on your own and just use your documents and and represent yourself but uh, uh, these appeals courts that is not really uh, available. Then there is Circular 230. Now this is the document that sets forth all of the rules having to do with practice before the IRS. So if you want to prepare other people's tax returns and be paid for that, then you're going to need to be familiar and use the rules uh, involved in Circular 230. Uh, this is Circular 230. You can find it uh, easily online. Um, it's actually part of the federal regulations. We talked about that earlier. Uh, and what that it has a table of contents. Notice how it is organized. This is very much the way things are organized uh, by the government. It's um, organized in paragraphs, parts, subparts, so forth. The little squiggly line is a section. Notice that while it does have page numbers, for the most part when we make reference to a government publication, um, it is done, the Internal Revenue Code, the regulations, it's done by section number, not by page number. And that's because things could change. These could at, be added in by a new law that would change the number, the, the page number, but because it would be the same topic, it would be the same section, uh, and that makes it easier to continue to find that. So as you look at these, each of these sections and what it deals with, um, this, if you come down here, looks very much like other documents we're gonna look at this semester. Uh, in terms of looking up the tax law and kind of this, kind of this two column, uh, lots of little edder, letters and numbers. So if you're making a reference to this, you wanna be able to tell somebody to go to section 10. This would be a, a subsection A, subsection B, uh, paragraph one, paragraph two, uh, that's part of subsection B so so that they can find it without having to look through the whole document. So it's a little different than what you're used to in terms of citing sources, but that's what we need to do a little practice at and make sure we can find things and s cite these original. This is an original source. This is the actual regulations as published by the Treasury Department. So if you don't comply with the rules, you can be uh, penalized, uh, be suspended, debarred, uh, publicly uh, called out. That's what censure means. You could be, you have to pay penalties and fines. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we don't uh, do anything that is uh, not in keeping with the rules. Uh, we have to get a PTIN number, although this has been challenged in court. Uh, if you are, all of the, those who prepare for, for you know, a fee need to uh, obtain continuing education. Every, the prepare, they have rules that those who are not CPAs or attorneys or old agents 
have to get some continuing education because those three groups already have to get their, you know, their, based on their profession, uh, continuing education. For uh, myself as a CPA, I have to get 80 hours every two years in continuing education. Uh, so they don't, they exempt me from uh, the, the requirements in Circular 230 because they know that I've already have to do that based on being a CPA. Okay, here's the list of things that, you, you know, short list of things that you need to be doing. Uh, you need to do it right. You have to sign a copy that, that has become electronic. You can do that electronically. Return your records. You can't hold on to stuff that the clients give you. You can make a copy, but you have to give that back to what them what they ask for it. Um, you have to notify errors. You have to provide information when asked from the IRS. You cannot claim a, a, a attorney privilege unless you're an attorney. Uh, so we don't ha we can't hide behind that, and we can't just do things that we know are wrong. We can only charge a contingent fee in certain areas. You're going to have a discussion uh, board about that question. Uh, you can't make things go on forever with the IRS, try, hoping that they'll give up, uh, make false statements, and work with a conflict of interest. So there's several things that are unethical and could cause you to be uh, disciplined if you do them. Again, this is almost never does someone go to jail. Uh, unless they are promoting these very serious things. Uh, so it is uh, almost always a civil action, which means there's not jail time involved, but it can be very expensive and it can cause you to not be able to represent people before the IRS in, in the future and even be publicly humiliated by you know, the IRS.